Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Liu Dongxing from UMass Dartmouth. Uh, welcome you to the tutorial on history of uh, system reliability optimization uh, given by Professor David Coit from Rutgers University. Dr. Uh, Coit also currently holds a visiting professor position at Tsinghua University, Beijing, China. His current teaching and research involves system reliability modeling and uh, optimization uh, and energy system optimization. His research, uh, his research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, industry, and uh, power utilities. He has been awarded several NSF grants, uh, including a career grant from NSF to develop new reliability optimization algorithms considering uncertainty. He has published over 120 journal papers and over 90 peer-reviewed conference papers. He had also received uh, several awards uh, for best papers and tutorials at the Reliability and Maintainability Symposium, uh, also known as RAMS. Uh, he received a bachelor degree in mechanical engineering University, uh, an MBA from RPI, and master, uh, and master and PhD in, in industrial engineering from the University of Pittsburgh. He is a department editor for IISE transactions uh, and an associate editor uh, for IEEE transaction on reliability and the Journal of Risk and Reliability. Okay, so let us welcome Dr. Coit uh, to give uh, us the tutorial talk. David? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, greetings from uh, New Jersey. It looks like uh, Professor Shing is in Hawaii. Um, <laughs> I, I wish I could be there too. <laughs> yeah, I'm on virtual vacation. Actually, I wish I was in Vancouver. It's my favorite city in North America. And for anyone who's never been there, put that on your list as, as number one. And so thank you to Professor Sheng for introducing me and, and thank you to the conference organizers. Uh, th this must have been an amazing amount of work to put this together. And as far as I can see, you've done a tremendous job. Okay, let me uh, proceed. Professor Sheng, can you see? Okay. Yes, I'll take it. It. Okay. All right, let me start. This is, um, I hope you consider this a somewhat entertaining and educational seminar, um, as opposed to a research seminar like you just heard. And if our previous speakers are still listening, I want to commend them. That was excellent. Um, it's a history of system reliability optimization. This is an area I know very well. Reliability optimization is something that I've been working on many years. I've been a professor at Rutgers. I think I'll be entering my 25th year, if I can make it through this year of the coronavirus. Maybe doubtful, but we'll, I'll do my best. Um, and this has always been an area I've, I've worked in. And of course, you could say, Professor Coit, you've been working in system reliability optimization for over 20 years. Haven't you solved all the problems yet? And what I'm gonna to try to convince you today is in fact, no. And in fact, there's many more problems to, um, to be solved, but that's at the end of my presentation. First, as the title implies, this is gonna be a history. We're gonna review some of the most important papers, some of the most important researchers who've worked in this area. Um, Professor Ching introduced me. Um, I'm from Rutgers University. I'll just skip this, I'm gonna hope I hope everyone in the audience knows about Rutgers University, but probably some do not. Uh, we're the State University of New Jersey. In terms of number of students, we're one of the biggest universities in Northeast America. Um, we're also one of the very oldest universities in America. In fact, number eight. Uh, we were formed before America even was a country. And to everyone listening now, and I'm sincere, you're invited to visit me. Just don't all come at the same day. In December of last year, we had a special issue 
in the journal Reliability, Engineering, and System Safety. This was co-edited by me and Enrico Zio, who apparently is giving a tutorial in the other virtual room right now. And this was a special issue on RAM's optimization. Um, 58 papers were submitted, only 13 were accepted. And let me be real clear, if you were one of the papers that got rejected, it was done by Enrico Zio, not me. And we had authors, we had some of the best authors. Greg Levitin, Yan Fu Li, my colleague at Tsinghua University, uh, Liu Dongxing, who introduced me, Gregory Levitin, Xiaoyan Zhu, I apologize, I can't pronounce the Chinese names, um, and others. Now, one of the papers, in fact, the very first paper was written by me, as, together with Enrico Zio. And it was called The Evolution of System Reliability Optimization. And more clearly, we were looking at specifically at complex system reliability optimization. First, what do I mean by complex? If you're optimizing, say, a preventive maintenance interval or an on-condition threshold, that's useful, that's great. I've written many papers like that. Um, but that's not what I mean by complex. I mean you have multiple components, more than you could consider individually. You have to have a systems perspective. And what do I mean by optimization? I mean it's something that you can, that you need mathematic, advanced mathematics generally, or perhaps an advanced heuristic or a search. But something more than looking at a graph something more than enumerate. This requires um, some sort of optimization approach. So when you combine them together, complex system reliability and optimization, that's really what I'm talking about today, my history of, and there's been thousands and thousands of papers written, and I don't mean to have a literature review here. No, not at all. And, but instead, I took all these papers and classified them somewhat generally, or maybe very generally. And I noticed as time went on, the focus of the papers naturally changed. It would be shocking if they did not. But I then realized you could classify this research into three, and I use the word eras, three eras of research, just like you look at the history of mankind. And as man evolved from, a, from an ape to the modern being, you can think of different eras of evolution. And that's the way I thought of it. Um, here's, here's the talk. And you can see here, I took all this research. And these are my names. I said the first era was mathematical programming. And by the way, that's what I teach at Rutgers um, in a semester that will start very soon. I teach linear optimization. Last semester, I taught a class in nonlinear optimization, and I taught a class in applied optimization. So optimization <laughs> all year. Um, so the first era was mathematical programming. Let's use some of these advanced operations research methods. But there's, as you'll see in my talk, there's some deficiencies. And the next era, I call the era of pragmatism. And Pragmatism isn't a word that's commonly used, I suppose, but pragmatism means being practical, solving real problems. So we went into this era of pragmatism. And as you'll see, a lot of good papers, but as you'll see, maybe, maybe it's time to move on. And I view the current era where people are working as the era of active reliability improvement and hopefully I have enough time to get to all that. I'll try to manage properly. First, before we go on and let me do this quickly, what do I mean by optimization? What do I mean by system reliability optimization? Imagine the top of the screen, we have this system structure and perhaps I can change the system architecture or 
maybe the type of redundancy, active, warm, warm standby, cold standby, or perhaps I can replace a component with a new one. And so it's a design problem. And you look in the yellow box, I'm trying to maximize or minimize some function, and then I have some constraints. So I say Z, what could the function Z be? Well, maximize reliability, minimize system cost rate, maximize availability for a network, maybe something else. But then there's constraints and X, X bold means a vector. That's a vector of design decisions. And there's gonna be a series of constraints that will limit just how reliable I can make this or how low the cost can be. And the constraints could be many things, generally cost, but it could be weight. And by weight, I mean physical weight, how much it weighs or volume or performance or something else. Now, even more generally, you know, I teach in industrial engineering, but my guess is the audience comes from many different disciplines, although all sharing a common interest in reliability or maintainability or something similar. But I come from industrial and systems engineering and I teach optimization. So for those of you maybe from a different field, Optimization, what is it? I have something we've referred to as an objective function. This is a performance measure. I either wanna make high, like reliability or low, like cost. But I'm either trying to maximize or minimize that. Then I got decision variables. So this be, how can I make that objective function better or worse? And how can I change it? These could be all sorts of design decisions, type of redundancy a component selection, something else. But then there's constraints. What's gonna keep me from achieving my end objective? So basically we have decision variables which represent the actions I can take, an objective function that tells me, well, how good is that solution? But finally, constraints that will limit. Okay, so this is what I mean by optimization. There's hundreds of different system reliability optimization problems. I'm gonna focus on the three historical and traditional ones, just, or else I'd spend the whole, the whole tutorial just introducing. One, what we call reliability optimization problem. The architecture or the system block diagram is fixed. That's fixed, those decisions have been made, but the reliability itself is a continuous decision variable, meaning I'm gonna design a component to match the reliability that is considered to be optimal for this, for this problem. So the general form of the problem is I'm gonna maximize reliability of the system by changing the component reliability values. So is this a hard problem? Well, yeah, it is. I have a nonlinear objective function I have nonlinear or, or maybe linear constraints, probably nonlinear, but I have continuous decision variables, meaning I can use, and again, if you're not familiar, you can use nonlinear programming. Or I, I can take a derivative if you, if you want me to get right down to a simple thing. I can take a derivative and search, or a partial derivative and search for good solutions. This is one problem. Second problem is now redundancy allocation problem. Here, the component reliabilities are known or they've been estimated from data. They're not decision variables. What's decision variables are the system architecture. They're, they're, although the component reliabilities may be known or, or estimated from data, we may not use that particular component. The decision variables, which components shall we use? how much redundancy in some problem formulations, what form of redundancy. And once again, the goal is to um, maximize system reliability or something else. So here we have a nonlinear objective function, nonlinear or, or linear constraints, actually often linear constraints, but have integer decision variables, which are more difficult to deal with. Now let's take problems one and two Combine them. And now we have RRAP, the reliability redundancy allocation problem. Now the system design and design variables are 
to be determined, but also the component reliability. So this is the most difficult problem. And I got very nonlinear, got a mixed integer uh, programming problem with the most difficult form of optimization problem, nonlinear objective function. Um, I don't know about the convexity, um, continuous and integer variables. Okay, so that's this, this overview. Now, I used the word before era. And the title of my paper in the special issue was the evolution of system reliability. So I mean evolution, just like we use the word, look at the picture. We've got the ape evolving into a man. And what's the definition? Because I'm an engineering professor, English isn't always my strongest capability. So I looked up evolution in the dictionary. Um, any process of formation or growth, development, a product of such development, something evolved. Well, that's exactly what I mean, except for I mean the types of research evolved and evolution of reliability research. Now, I hope this next slide works. I'll let it finish before speaking. Well, what I'm doing is looking at these eras and selecting some key researchers. You know, I, I pick and choose. And these are the areas we're going to talk about. Mathematical programming, pragmatism, and what I determine is active reliability improvement. First, we start with this era of mathematical programming. More specifically, dynamic programming, linear or integer programming, nonlinear programming. And I include evolutionary algorithms in this group. I'll explain why later, even though it's not actually mathematical programming, but it's the, it's the transition. It represents a transition that allowed us to switch from the era of mathematical programming to the era of pragmatism. So first, mathematical programming. I identified a few key individuals. Dr. Richard Bellman, who I'm going to talk about very shortly. Dr. George Danzig and Wei Kuo, who I unfortunately missed it because of the time zone difference is my fault. I got, I got in, I listened in time to hear Bill Meeker yesterday, but um, but Wei Kuo was the first speaker yesterday, and I bet a lot of people here know him as a university president and a department chair and an author and so many other things, and I do too, but I also know him as a, a researcher for many years. First, we'll start with Richard Bellman. If people listening to me don't know who this is, please remember. In operations research, he, he maybe is not the most, in my opinion, most important researcher ever, but he's in the top five. He's in the top five. He invented dynamic programming. Um, he lived in, he's, he's, he's you know, dead. He's lived in New Jersey. He, and he invented dynamic programming um, when he was working, I believe, for Rand Corporation. And, and this is, other than maybe the invention of the simplex algorithm in operations research, this is perhaps, in my opinion, the most important achievement. Now, what is dynamic programming? Okay, if you've never heard, if you've never heard of dynamic programming, I'm not going to be able to teach you today, but I can give you an idea. Uh, look at this diagram. I need to get to start to seven, start to finish as fast as I can, but I have multiple paths to go. Now the numbers in the circles represent times. It takes me four time units to get along from start to one. And once I'm at one, it takes five, et cetera. Now the, num the red numbers in the box, they represent the shortest amount of time I can get to that node. Well, one, two, three, it's easy. There's only one way to go. But four, five, six, there's different ways to go. 
And so dynamic programming goes stage by stage. It's a recursive algorithm that calls itself at an earlier stage. So let's go to four, five, six. I, the minimum I can get there is 10, 9, and 17, the red numbers. Now when I get to stage three, all I have to do is look back one stage. I don't need to know anything before four, five, six. All I have to do is look at the red numbers and then continue the blue numbers from two to three. Now, what if there was 10 stages or 100 stages? All I have to do is look back one. Okay, that's a very simple explanation. But the point is I can solve large combinatorial problems. How does it relate to reliability? Well, when Bellman invented dynamic programming, almost the very first application he looked for, and let's be honest, he invented algorithm, uh, dynamic programming because he was a mathematician and then went searching for applications. But one of the first applications he found was reliability. And so I could be wrong and I can't ask Professor Bellman, but as far as I can see, the first paper ever written on system reliability optimization was Bellman's paper with his colleague who's also very famous, Stuart Dreyfus, in the journal Operations Research, 1958. Now, again, briefly, and I need to keep looking at my at the time, instead of going from the start to the finish, he's trying to design a system reliability. And the stages here are not different paths. They're the subsystems. So stage one is the first parallel subsystem. Now, parameter beta, and let me see if I can do this. Parameter beta, so let's look at the problem. I want to maximize system reliability. I have this design vector x, but I have a cost constraint, and just one constraint for demonstration purposes. Beta means some part of capital C. In other words, beta can't be higher than C. It means some part of capital C. And for f of one, beta is what part of capital C, my cost constraint, am I gonna use just for this first subsystem? Well, first subsystem is really easy. Just like, just like the first path in the go from start to finish. All I'm gonna do is take beta and put in as many components as I can in parallel because that will improve um, the reliability. But now, stage two. Beta now is the amount of capital C I'm going to use for both one and two together. Well, I can take some of it and use for one. Once again, let me get my pointer out. I can use some of it um, for one, but not all of it, because I need to worry about two. And as I increase the reliability of two, by adding redundant components, that's less of the beta I can use for one. Now, let me just wrap this up. As I go to stage three, which is one, two, and three all together, all I have to do is look back to the previous function. And finally, I go to the end, and now I'm not using beta anymore. I'm going to use the entire cost constraint. Okay, again, if you've never heard of dynamic programming, I doubt I've taught it to you, but just trust me, is one of the most important inventions in uh, optimization and operations research. Now, Bellman solved a pretty simple problem, but let's not, let's not take any credit away from him. He was number one. Ten, about 10 years later, Fife, Hines, and Lee says, well, wait a minute, we can, start to, we can start to do better than that. And they looked at systems that had three and four different component choices and two linear constraints. And, um, and, did, and, and, and did really the most important paper that uses dynamic programming to solve reliability. Now, in my first slide, I gave a picture of George Dancing. George Dancing invented the simplex algorithm in the 1950s, I believe. And um, he, did, he himself didn't work on reliability, but he invented linear programming and linear programming uh, and I use the word simp I use the word simplex algorithm and linear programming same thing same thing 
although there's other ways to solve linear programming, so I guess not exactly the same thing. But it, you know, you generally can't use it because um, system reliability problems are highly nonlinear. But nevertheless, you can use some tricks and substitutions and use linear programming. There's not too many examples, but here's one, Gear and Taylor. In some of my own papers, I've used a similar approach. They make the problem actually much bigger, so that that means harder to solve, but also it becomes linear and they use a series of zero one decision variables. Let's move on. Now, I showed you before Professor Wei Kuo. Um, I remember when I was a graduate student, and that's a few years ago, and I'm working on system reliability optimization, and I see these references from way back, uh, Wei Kuo, and you know, as, as I think everyone, everyone here <laughs> better know who he is. Um, but you may not realize when he was a student himself, and, and even Wei Kuo was a student once, um, and as a young professor, he wrote the, some of the very best papers on using nonlinear programming. And so he was solving like the first problem. And I picked this problem uh, it, it, because this was one of the very, very first problems. So what do we mean by nonlinear programming? Look at the, the graph in the lower, the lower part, lower right. Here, nonlinear programming is a search. The circles, the concentric circles in that graph represent a topological view of some objective function. And I'm trying to find the minimum or the maximum. Nonlinear programming or nonlinear optimization basically uses a gradient vector, a vector of partial derivatives to search around. And as you can see in the graph, we're searching, trying to find that minimum because we don't know where it is. So, so this I view is then the, um, the other very important part. Once again, we're still in this mathematical programming. And I don't know why I put this in. My first trip to China was 2005. Uh, Professor Li Rong Tui had a conference there. Uh, Professor Xing was there. Um, the whole conference started to climb the Great Wall, and there I am, this, this sweaty guy here. <laughs> and there's Wei Kuo, and we, these are the only people who made it all the way to the end. Anyways, let's move on. Now, I'm gonna end this discussion of um, the era of mathematical programming with my own paper um, that is reliability optimization using a genetic algorithm. This actually was the very first paper, and quite frankly, I think the least interesting part of my own PhD dissertation in 19, well, it was published in 1996. Um, but this paper, to the surprise of me, um, because I, if I rank my own papers, I don't consider it particularly noteworthy, but this paper now has the second most citations ever in the journal IEEE Transactions on Reliability. And it wasn't that we used the genetic algorithm, big deal. I mean, we were first, uh, well, uh, at the same time with a paper by Painton and Campbell. Um, um, but, what we, but what makes this paper so popular is we demonstrated we can relax a lot of restrictive assumptions. The mathematical programming methods often we're making assumptions about system design only so they could solve the problem. And I had worked in industry prior to getting my PhD and you know, I looked at some of these assumptions and said, well, that's not right. And can we relax them? And the answer was, well, no, because then we no longer can solve the optimality. I said, yeah, but can we get really good solutions? And that's, that was what this paper uh, demonstrated. We, in fact, could solve now a much broader range of problems. So let's, let's review the era of mathematical programming. Mathematically rigorous, good. Provable optimal solutions, nothing wrong with that. Renowned researchers, good. So let's stop. Oh, no. Restrictive assumptions, really small problems and unrealistic problems. In other words, and the, no criticism, trust me, no, no criticism. But we had problems that we could write a research paper on 
but they weren't really real system design problems. Not, often not, I should say. And those of us who are academics and write research paper, we know we, we all do that. I do it. But still, maybe time to move on. So we moved from mathematical programming to what I call the era of pragmatism, more diverse problems. Let's look at some issues that maybe mathematical programming can't deal with. Fewer assumptions. But to do that, we're going to have to be less rigorous, use things like the genetic algorithm. So the focus evolves slowly from how can the problem be solved to what problem should be solved. So I go to this era of pragmatism. Again, these are just some examples. I could have different examples. So I have here Gregory Levitin, Enrico Zio. You know, I tried, I searched around. I wanted to get a bad picture of Enrico Zio, but I don't think there is one. <laughs> um, so what do I mean by more, by pragma, pr pragmatic problems? Multi-state system, consideration of uncertainty, different types of redundancy. And I suppose I didn't state this specifically, but the mathematical programming approaches required active redundancy. So if you had warm standby, uh, warm standby or cold standby, those generally wouldn't work. So multi-state systems. Um, once again, this is the title of my talk is history. So let's let's think of history. What were the first papers on multi-state systems? Now again, I don't know if this is number one. I should ask Kyle Kapoor, who, by the way, is giving a tutorial sometime at this conference. And please, please go to that one. Uh, he's a he's a he's a pioneer. Um, but as far as I could see, about the first paper ever written on multi-state systems was by Kyle Kapoor and his student, 1983. Now, right around the same time, in Norway. Terje Avon wrote a paper on a pretty much exactly the same topic. Now, I don't think at the time Kapoor and Avon knew each other. Uh, maybe, I doubt it though. But they wrote papers on about the same topic in the same time. And what do we mean by multi-state systems? The component behavior is more complex than zero one, working, not working. It goes through a series of states from fully functional to finally failed. Multi-state systems is rather very difficult. And these two papers by Avon and uh, Kapoor, they're not optimization papers. Although in Kapoor's paper, he shows how you can kind of select a better design, but it's not in my first, in my introduction, what I considered to be mathematical optimization. That takes nothing away. Th these papers are huge achievements. Um, and here they are, and um, both of them are still active researchers. Well, Cal might be, yeah, let's, let me just leave. He's given, and Kapoor's giving a, a, a tutorial um, at this conference. If his tutorial was the same time as mine, I'd say, go, 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 because he's a really famous and, and noteworthy uh, researcher, as is Avon, who's now the editor of the Journal of Risk and reliability. So that was what, mid 80s. So you need to go about 15 years later till you start thinking about, well, optimization of multi-state systems. And, you know, again, I'm not claiming to be the, the first paper or whatever, but it's maybe the one that's the most famous and the most noteworthy, and that's Levitin and Lizniowski, if you were at the SMRLO conference in Beijing last year, uh, hosted by Liron Tui. Professor Lizniowski was one of the keynote speakers, and, and Professor Levitin, or Dr. Levitin, is, you know, very active, uh, too active. I have to review too many of his papers. Um, but they work to optimize multi-state systems. 
And again, it's a difficult problem. We can't solve the optimality. So as, as these two gentlemen are well known for, they use the universal generating function. And I won't go into an explanation that starts to get complex pretty fast. But they use the universal generating function to keep track of these different multi-states and how they work together. And then they use the genetic algorithm to uh, determine the best design. As I said, my paper has the uh, second most number of citations. By the way, the, the, the paper that has the most citations is the famous uh, software reliability, uh, Goyle. Goyle, um, oh, I forget his uh, co-author's name. And so Levitin is one of the reasons he kept referencing my paper. So I told Gregory, who I happen to know very well, I said, Gregory, I'm giving this tutorial on uh, multi-state systems. I said, tell me your two best papers. And this, is, this, is, this was Gregory's decision, and, but he actually picked two papers with, with the woman who introduced me, Professor Shing. He said this one, well, he said he considers these as two best papers. Um, this is a, a 2010 paper. Um, failures. This is reliability and performance of multi-state systems with propagated failures having selective effect. Failures from different elements. You can see the dotted lines. Gregory gave me these figures. Um, can cause failures of different subsets of elements. And I'm already, I'm, I'm worried, a little bit worried about finishing. So here's some more details. And then he said this one also with Professor Shink. He said this, he considers this one of his best papers from 2018. Optimizing dynamic performance of multi-state systems with heterogeneous one out of n warm standby components. So let me, let me kind of move on. Now, Pragmatism. The mathematical programming um, papers, they said, well, they said either you need to know the reliability of the component reliabilities, or the component reliability was a decision variable, meaning you're going to determine a specific value, and then that assumes you can either find a component or design a component to match that. Well, I don't know about you guys. I can I can look up the cost in a manual. I can put something on a scale and weigh it or look for its volume. But I'm still looking for a meter that I can take a component and measure the reliability directly. I don't think it's been invented yet. It's difficult to estimate reliability. You need data or perhaps some physics of failure, but, but whatever you use, there's going to be uncertainty because there is no meter. And, you know, you can have field data, you can have test data, and there's different types of uncertainty, but there is, in fact, uncertainty. And so to ignore that, you know, doesn't seem, you know, I mean, I understand the engineering requires assumptions, but nevertheless, and then also consider this. I sometimes, my neighbors, my neighbors, they don't know what I do. I mean, they know I'm a professor, and even family members. They say, uh, what do you do? I say, I study system reliability. And they say, oh, you must study things that fail a lot. And I say, uh, no, actually the things we study hardly ever fail. And then they give me a funny look and they say, well, you must have an easy job then. And I say, no, that's not true. We do tend to study things that are already reliable, like the energy network, like telecommunications networks, airplanes, satellites, because they're still not reliable enough. Or because the implications of failure are so critical and so important. So we're studying things that are already pretty reliable, which once again means we don't have much data or we need to accelerate. So we do have uncertainty. And I've written many papers. Um, I had an excellent PhD student, Tung Dan Jin, who worked with me, and he's a professor now, at Texas State University, on many of these issues. Um, I picked this paper. Um, this was a paper I had a visiting researcher from Italy, Luca Podolafini, who now lives in Switzerland and is a researcher for, um, I think it's like a government lab in, in Switzerland. 
he came to work with me one summer and produced uh, uh, this paper. We have a network system that we're trying to design and we have uncertainty with all the components. Difficult problem. We had to estimate system reliability with Monte Carlo simulation and we had to use a genetic algorithm to solve it, meaning we're not gonna get the optimal solution and we're not even gonna get a specific solution. Consider this graph. These are all prospective solutions of that network problem. I've got along the x-axis reliability, along the y-axis, listen carefully, the variance of the system reliability estimate, and I should be more specific, the x-axis is the reliability estimate, which is subject to uncertainty. And I want the reliability to be high, but I want that variance to be low too. And if you don't understand that, because this is called risk aversion, if you don't understand that, let me give you an example. Let's say you were about ready to step on an airplane. And as you step on the airplane, the person who greets you says, this airplane is very reliable. You'd, you'd be happy, you'd like that, and you'd get aboard. Next day on your flight back, you step on the airplane, and then they greet you, they say, this airplane is very reliable on average. You say, wait a minute, on average, what do you mean? You go, sometimes it is. Actually, even most of the time. And you would, you, would, you would step off. You'd say, well, maybe this one isn't. Well, that's risk aversion. You're worried about how bad something could be, not just the estimate. And for reliability, we tend to be risk averse. Now let's narrow in on those solutions in the circle. What we see here is I can, the system, the system designs that are most reliable that's the upper right of the graph, have a higher variance of system reliability estimate. And I'm often, if I can still get a very reliable design, I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to select a design that maybe the reliability estimate is not so high if I know it's a good estimate. Anyways, there's now been many papers written on this. Let's move on. Uh, this was, um, Another paper written by Yan Fu Li of Tsinghua University. Uh, if any of his colleagues are listening, tell him I gave him a shout out. Um, uh, but um, Enrico Zio, I asked specifically, I said, tell me a good paper. And he specifically mentioned, mentioned this one. He uses fuzzy. Um, he uses fuzzy to, to consider the uncertainty. So this is a paper, IEEE Transactions and Reliability, Random Fuzzy Extension of the Universal Generating Function Approach for Reliability Assessment of Multi-State Systems under different types of uncertainty. Now let's move on. The next area of pragmatism is different types of redundancy. Now, when I was a PhD student, I'm reading all these papers by Wei Kuo and, 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 and Garen Taylor and Thelman, and excuse me, um, uh, other researchers, and they all are active redundancy. And I, I had worked as an engineer before my PhD and I'm thinking, you know, that's not true. And if they did consider cold standby at all, they assume the failure time distributions were exponential. And for those of us who work in this area, we know why. Because the sum of exponentials is gamma or K Erlang. And so this is just off my head. I said about 95% of the papers assume active redundancy. And if it's active redundancy, we don't care the failure time distribution if we're just gonna um, maximize system reliability at fixed time T. And the very few papers the considered cold standby always had constant hazard rates or exponential failure time distribution. And then I said, well, what is, what are, what, what, what's real designs? And I said, it's not like that. It's not like that. You've got a whole lot of cold standby and you got a whole lot of non-constant uh, hazard rates. So that inspired me to write several papers. I'll just highlight this one. This is a pretty well-known paper. I wrote single author. And let me tell you something, let me give you a clue. If you look at, uh, Professor Shing said I have something like 120 papers and that's true. The ones that have no co-authors, they're the ones I'm kind of proud of. I I'm proud of the ones with co-authors too. <laughs> but if there's no co-authors, that means, you know, okay, I sat down, you know, all alone 
Anyways, this is what I'm proud of. I said, look, the type of redundancy is in fact a decision variable. I don't know if I'm gonna use active or cold standby. Um, that's a decision to be made. And if it's a decision to be made, it should be part of my optimization algorithm. And so we formulated, we, I formulated this problem where that becomes a decision variable. And I also um, had non-constant hazard rates. And I say there's a switch. That if you're gonna use active redundancy, meaning everything is being operated simultaneously, you don't need a switch. The redundant components are already working. But if you have cold standby, and I know there's warm standby too. I didn't address that in this paper. Um, other researchers have. But if there's cold standby, the redundant element is not activated and you need to sense a failure and activate it. And that activate, sensing and activation, that itself can fail. And so what we, um, what we kind of learned is if that switch never fails, okay, I have two graphs here. The um, blue line is uh, active redundancy. The, the uh, pink or whatever color that is, that's standby. If the switch never fails, well, then cold standby is always better. Then it's an easy decision, easy decision. But if the switch does fail, the cold standby reliability has a limit. It's not going to be more reliable than the switch itself. And at some point, active redundancy becomes better. So in that paper, I define some parameter n i j prime, which is the point where we switch from one to the other. Okay, let's move on. And I've got, um, I'm going to need to talk fast, which I'm often, well, when I'm in China, people say I talk too fast, but in America, they say I talk slow because I'm from upstate New York. Um, so we have the air of pragmatism, uh, more diverse problems, fewer assumptions, less rigorous, but they're one-time analyses. I haven't talked about that. In other words, we do the analysis once, we hope the engineers like the results, and then we move, we, we go away, we go away. And that's, 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 well, that's a lot of our research is like that, but it's not right. We assume we have homogeneous population. And as I often say in reliability, we might have homogeneous populations of hardware. We sure don't have homogeneous populations of system users. They're gonna stress and overstress and expose different environments. And so our models that are all based on homogeneous populations, and I understand you need to make assumptions, but we need to think about these assumptions. And also we, it requires distributional assumptions, failure times liable or, or failure time is something else. And often we don't revisit those assumptions. We conduct analysis. So this goes to what I call era of active reliability uh, improvement. Where here, we don't optimize just one time. In fact, sometimes we never stop optimizing. And in fact, we can collect new data as the system is being operated and our optimization model can reflect that new data. And we can have customized distributions where we have heterogeneous distributions as opposed to homogeneous distributions. And our optimization algorithm can address that lack of homogeneity. So the focus evolves slowly from solving a problem once for a common user to customize and dynamic reliability optimization. And I'm claiming we're in this era right now, the era of active reliability improvement. Not that we're not continuing to do other things, obviously. And so many great research is going on here. So I've picked two. Some of it is self-serving because it's my own research, but I said dynamic system reliability models responding to new data. System reliability, and the second, system reliability optimization customized for specific subsets of users, or there could be subsets of different environments or something else. 
Here I just, I, I, I put my friend here, Professor Nagy Gabriel from Georgia Tech. If you don't know Professor Gabriel, he's, um, he's impressive um, and uh, continues to be, he's at Georgia Tech. Um, here's a paper by Dr. Professor Gabriel. Um, dynamic system reliability. Here's what's going on here. We have a wind farm. We're collecting data all the time and we're using predictive maintenance. In other words, as opposed to condi on condition or time-based, we have predictive maintenance, which means at all time, we're updating our model and predicting when the next failure will occur. Now, that predictive maintenance then feeds an optimization model where the decision variables are which of these wind farms to maintain and when. So he's constantly almost in real, well, not in real time, but very often, you know, in a sense, it could be real time, solving this optimization problem dynamically. So not just once and hope the engineers like it. So he has an integrated framework maintenance that combines predictive using real-time sensor data to predict future degradation and remaining lifetime of the wind turbines. And it all feeds into an optimization model. Minimize cost, or no, excuse me, maximize profit, given I've got to maintain these things. And if I let them fail, they're not going to generate um, energy, but they also don't generate energy when I'm fixing them. So this is one example. Um, quickly, here's another example from Cambridge University in the UK. I had the first author, Hao Li, as a visiting researcher at Rutgers. Um, and uh, actually the second one too, Adria. Uh, Hao is a graduate of Tsinghua University and li living back in Beijing. Um, quickly, they call this a social network, where now we have these assets that are aging and we have an issue. Can I pull the data together for all these assets? that are of different ages, they're the same types of assets. But if I do that, I'm assuming homogeneous population or do I treat all the data individually? But then I don't have enough to make future predictions. So she, she has what she calls the social network that where a neural network decides that maybe these neighboring systems can give you a valuable input as to what the reliable of this is, even if I can't pull them together. And then it feeds an optimization model similar to Professor Gabriel, when to do maintenance. And so this is a social network of collaborating industrial assets. This is the Journal of Risk and Reliability. I'm watching my clock. Um, I put these two papers next. These are written by myself, uh, Xiaoyan Zhu. Uh, the first paper is written by, by my former PhD student, Nita Shatwatanasari. If I have any people listening from Thailand, that's the best I can do with her name. Uh, here, we use two-stage stochastic optimization where we're designing a system structure or architecture, but a maintenance plan also. But the maintenance plan is what's referred to second stage variables where depending on the environment that the system is gonna be exposed to, it may not and not, it may not, it will not require the same maintenance plan. So we define a group of scenarios, which are the way users are going to stress and operate the system. We've assumed that the design is going to be common for all of them, but the maintenance plan can be specific. And yet we throw them all together in an optimization model. So here's two papers. Uh, you see on the top, one is from IEEE Transactions and Reliability, 2017. The one over here to the right is 2019, last year, European Journal of Operations Research. These papers originated because I was fortunate enough, two different summers to be, um, I forget my exact title, but a visiting research fellow, I think that's right. I was a visiting research fellow at the University Chinese Academy of Science in Haidian in Beijing. So uh, I spent two summers there, um, well, parts of two summers. Um, and we worked and we did not just these two papers, there's other ones as well. So 
this is what I basically said. I said, traditionally, how many papers have been written by system design optimization? A lot, a lot by me. How many papers have been written on maintenance optimization? A lot. But the two papers normally are one or the other. And why is that? Because the thought is, look at the arrow, that these are sequential decisions. You design a system, and then given that system design, you have maintenance optimization. Now, if someone in the audience is from, say, aircraft or aircraft engine, they would say, no, Professor Coit, that's not true. When we design it, we absolutely consider maintenance. I know that. I know that, but the research papers in the journals fit this model. The paper has been system design optimization or maintenance optimization. So with my student Nita Shatwatanasari and then uh, Professor Ju at UCAS, I say, we, we kind of, we said, well, wait a minute, look at the, we, let's combine these. Why? Because the system design impacts which maintenance plan is optimal. And the system design that may seem very good may lead to an op maintenance plan, which is not very good. And so we need to combine these. And that's what this research was. And um, it's pretty much my last slide. I have a student, Jian Zhou, who defended his PhD this week. And part of his dissertation, same thing. No, well, no, not the same thing, but the same general concept. This is for the electrical power grid. We can do hardening. If you don't know the term hardening, that's used in the uh, electrical industry, electricity. I mean, simply make it more reliable. Sometimes very simple things, like trim the trees along a transmission line, or take a power substation and elevate it a couple feet so that it can withstand a flood. But, but those cost things too. And so here we're, we are combining hardening with system restoration, meaning if there's an extreme event like a hurricane or flood or tsunami. Um, how do I restore it most efficiently? And same as before, the type of hardening we pick will impact which restoration is best. So we want to combine them. We've not, we haven't written a paper on this yet. Um, and we're always looking for collaborators, at least I am, um, but we will shortly. <laughs> We will shortly. Don't, don't solve this before we finish our paper. So this is about my last slide. We see we have these extreme events. Look, look down, there's a substation with a fire and we see lightning. And then, oh, we're gonna restore. Jen Joe did this slide. <laughs> oh, we're gonna do some, we need some sort of, you know, restoration. Ah. Maybe we need to make the system more reliable by adding these. That would be an example of hardening. But you have to do the hardening before the restoration. Okay, let me summarize this way. This is about exactly one hour. What did I say the first paper was? 1958 or something? That's a long time ago. Most of my listeners, the great majority, aren't alive. So um, haven't you solved all the problems yet, Professor Coit? And my main point here is not even close, not even close. This is a rich research area. Now we have machine learning. I just wrote my first paper with my students where we use reinforcement learning to solve a system reliability optimization problem. Uh, not even close. Now that we have sensors, big data, more data, we can integrate all that together and get much better optimization uh, problems. And with that, I conclude uh, my talk. Thank you. You're muted, Ludan. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Coit, for the great and uh, comprehensive tutorials. So I have a question here from the chat. Um, I recall there were papers on continuous state, prop, uh, state reliability. Uh, any optimization models proposed around that concept? He also com comments that a degradation is a kind of a model of continuous state system. Yeah. Um, w w when my students uh, defend their thesis, often they have more slides uh, than they have time for. And it's, I tell them, put those slides at the end. Someone might ask a question. Okay? I do the same thing. <laughs> I do the same thing. 
Yes, absolutely. This is a slide I took out because I was I have limited time. So absolutely, a system degradation model is so here's here's a good problem. I don't think there's any papers or there, I think there are a few. You know, we'll have to check like Ji Shang Yi, he writes papers so quickly, he can't keep up. <laughs> and uh, um, but here's the problem I want to do. And, and you'll see probably 2020, a paper written by me. I've got a system. They're all degrading continuously, not multi-state. But the, the, the line you see there is a failure threshold. But what's the decision variable? The decision variable is an on-condition threshold. Now, the failure threshold we assumed is known. The on-condition threshold is not known. I can, I can select it. And perhaps the inspection time also is a decision variable, although often decision makers. So whoever answered the question, and somehow I can't seem to find my chat um, feature on Zoom, but that's OK, as long as Professor Shing tells me. So I don't think there's many papers. There's lots of papers on continuous reliability. But if you want to formulate it as a complex, you know, if you have two components, that's not complex. Four components, that's not complex. But if you want to have a system with many components and continuous um, reliability, like a degradation model, I think, you know, I mean, a lot of papers, a lot of journals, but that's a rich research area. That's the area that I know I'm going to be working on. And whoever asked the question, <laughs> I don't know if you're a student or Professor, I'm glad to work on it too. How come I can't see chat? Well, who knows? Okay, <clears throat> so since we won't have, you know, another session until nine hour later, so I will take another one or two questions. So here's another one. Uh, what are the methods you use to integrate new data into maintenance decisions? How do you deal with the data uncertainty? Yeah, so as part, we didn't write any papers on that. And, um, but as part of my student, Nita Shatwatanasari's uh, PhD dissertation, she did, she, she did that. And we may have written some conference papers. I can't keep track of my own papers always. But what we did is we assumed we had a Bayesian prior for everything. Well, excuse me, we had to simplify the model. But we have a Bayesian, we have failure time distribution for the components. And then later we extended it to a gamma process or no, we used a um, kind of a simpler model like the Meeker and Lou degradation model. Um, I call it a random effects model. But, but we assume the parameters had a Bayesian prior. So we solve the problem. It's just iterative. We solve the problem. We collect new data. And then what we do, kind of unique, we say once it's been fielded, you can no longer change the design, but you can change the maintenance. So what we did, we took, so we collected the new data, got posterior distributions. And I told my students, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't know much about Bayesian reliability other than what I learned from reading textbooks. So I told my students, keep it simple. Whatever Nagy Gabriel did in his papers, do the same. But then it feeds two models. One says design um, is too late. You can only update maintenance. Because once it's been fielded, it's hard to update design. But then it fed another model that says, well, what if you did change the design? What would the cost benefits be? And then the goal was that would be trigger. But that's, that, that's work, um, that's unpublished work that I did with my student, Nita Shatwatanasari. Um, I'd say that's my own work. Um, I'd say Nagi Gabriel's work already does that um, because he constantly, um, he's updating all time. Now he doesn't fit a distribution like I do because he's, he's, you know, he's so practical. Um, he doesn't think the way I do and that's probably a good thing. Um, so, so that's the other way. Okay, uh, I think we will stop here. Uh, so if you have any further questions, uh, please feel free to email Dr. Uh, uh 
And let us thank you, uh, Dr. Hoyt, again for his great presentation. Uh, thank you, David, for your support to the conference. Thank okay. you. And, and thank you, uh, everyone. And uh, it was great to, well, actually, I didn't see anyone. I see a few, <laughs> but yeah. great to have people in attendance. And once again, thank you to Stephen Lee and Ming. Um, and, you know, Stephen, we can see Vancouver in the background. Yeah. We wish we were there. <laughs> By imagination. <laughs> What's that beautiful park, Stanley Park? I would go there as soon as my talk was over. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much, David. And uh, thank you for everybody else attending this tutorial. And we'll see you back in more tutorials in nine hours. So take a good break. Bye for now. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. OK.